All right, welcome everybody to the December 7th edition of the USV Brown Bag. My name is Adam Eckerly, uh, hosting tonight's show. Um, we've got uh, a, a really good guest for you tonight, Safia Abdallah, uh, and she's going to be talking about forking public work, uh, committing and managing the PR process uh, just in time for commitments. Uh, so a few handful of slides to go through tonight before, uh, before I hand it over to Safia, um, if I can advance here. There we go. So um, you can see the, the Twitter handles that we use. Uh, if you have questions tonight, um, you, you can use the chat or the Q&A in the GoToMeeting platform, or you can use the hashtag VBrownBag on Twitter. I'll be monitoring all of those things. Uh, and then um, you can see the, the ongoing schedule. Uh, and then also you can see how to reach uh, Safia and myself uh, on Twitter. Uh, so something that's pretty exciting, uh, if you haven't been to a V Brown bag recently, um, but it is getting close to Christmas and the holiday season. And I uh, just want to thank our awesome sponsors uh, who are having a, uh, a pretty decent amount of giveaways. Uh, as you can see, some pretty cool um, prizes up here uh, from all of our sponsors, and I'll just go ahead and name them for posterity and to, to make sure they get plenty of airtime. But Drobo, Solid Fire, uh, Way, Rubric, Nutanix, Tintree, Cohesity, and yet another page Veeam, Blue Medora, Datrium, Pearson, Round Tower, uh, that Ahmad Yunus guy. I, I don't know if you guys like him, I'm, I'm a little biased, but he does happen to have the coolest t shirt around uh, that he's given away ahead and uh, log in VSI. Uh, so uh, please take some time to head over to vbrownbag.com uh, and, and read up on, on the giveaways and how to get involved. And then last, uh, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, it is Commitmas. Um, you can see, you can use the hashtag to join in the conversation, uh, but just you know to kind of keep things all in one place, at least for the next hour, uh, I think we're going to focus on uh, the V Brown Bag hashtag, but feel free to throw in the commitments hashtag as well uh, if you have room. Uh, and if you don't know what commitments is, uh, there's some URLs to kind of get started, um, and you can even join the Slack team uh, to, to um, join in. Uh, so with that, I will hand it off to Safia. Let me, uh, or Safia, sorry. Um, You're good. Do you think you can have it share my screen, Adam? Yep, absolutely. Should be uh, popping up momentarily. Awesome. Okay, uh, hopefully everyone out there uh, can can see my screen. I've just got a browser window open to GitHub. Uh, thanks, Adam, for the really wonderful intro. Um, I'm going to start off on the sort of webinar. It's going to be super informal. I'm going to really quickly go through what the entire process of committing to a um, public open source project would look like, and then I'll open the floor to questions if anyone listening has um, a specific need that they um, want addressed or something like that. And so I'm going to assume a couple of things starting off. I'm going to assume that as you're kind of starting into your commitments journey, uh, you have an idea of a project that you want to commit to. Another thing I'm going to assume is that um, this project is using Git and that they are hosted on GitHub. Um, there are several open source projects that don't use Git and that aren't hosted on GitHub. I think a majority of the ones that are great for people who are just getting started into open source um, are kind of looking to start engaging with this kind of stuff um, are probably going to be on GitHub because there's a great um, user experience set up with GitHub and um, it's kind of becoming the one-stop shop for a lot of open source related work. And you have um, a project that you found on GitHub. In this particular example, I'm just using a project that I recently contributed to, uh, which is the Node.js project. Um, and let's say we're starting off completely fresh um, and you're wondering what do I need to do to submit a pull request uh, to Node.js or to help them out with development. 
One thing you're going to want to do is scroll down and see if they've got a contributing.md file. Uh, this is kind of standard across um, a ton of open source projects nowadays. If I go ahead and open up the one in Node, uh, you'll notice it outlines their code of conduct, how you make issue contributions, and it gives you a step-by-step -step gu step -step guide for making a code contribution, so committing to the actual uh, source code. And you'll see a document like this in pretty much every open source project that you are looking to contribute to. Uh, so whether it's React is another one that I've contributed to that has that, Interact, um, tons of projects will have a contributor mark contributing markdown file. This is the best place to start. Um, go ahead and read through it. You'll notice here it's got like all the details of what you need to do step by step. Uh, it describes things. Um, like how the project structures their commit messages. Uh, different projects have different guidelines for how they uh, structure branch names and uh, commit messages and things like that, and that's generally connected to whatever kind of automation or repository management tools they have set up in place. Uh, so that's a good thing to keep an eye on is like how does the project like things to be ordered. Um, it's really useful for the people who are maintaining the project to get things with a certain, um, to get things like commit messages um, or pull request titles with a certain consistency. And so uh, the React or the Node uh, project has all of the steps um, that you would need to know um, to get started with the project. So this contributing markdown file is the first thing that you want to look at once you've landed into a new project. I know if you go to other resources, they'll tell you hop into the issues tab and find an issue to work on um, and then read like the contributing markdown file. I think you should actually do the opposite, which is um, read the contributing markdown file, get oriented with the project, their process, kind of how they do things, um, and then find an issue to contribute to. Um, so let's say you've read this document. Um, you can go ahead and hop onto the issues tab. And this is just the issue tracker where these projects are going to keep um, all of their bugs, feature requests, documentation requirements, all of that fun stuff that you need to make software uh, work. And so uh, you'll notice um, that some projects, um, I know not all projects adhere to this, um, will have some sort of tag that um, indicates that a particular issue is um, a good first contribution or good for new contributors. And you'll kind of have to read through all of the labels they have in place to figure out what that label is. Here on the Node project, it's the label good first contribution. So if you click on that, it filters um, to all of the issues that the Node team has sort of marked as things that are good for um, new contributors to take on. Uh, and you can kind of scroll through and pick one that you want to do. Um, you'll notice most of these are testing and documentation uh, bugs or issues. Those are the easiest ones to do to get involved with the project. I'm going to just pick a really random one because uh, we're not actually going to, to make a PR or commit to this. Um, but this one says that um, a particular um, markdown file at this file path needs a better explanation of the exports concept um, in JavaScript. So let's say that's the issue we want to tackle. Um, we're like committed to this one. We A good thing to do um, or kind of a good checklist to go through as you're finding a good issue um, to work on is A, do I have the expertise to work on this? And Expertise doesn't necessarily mean like you know exactly how to fix the issue and you've got it down pat. It could mean that you have a good idea of where you need to go to find out what you need to do or what resources you need to um, seek out. It doesn't mean that like I should know everything about the like JavaScript module system or something like that. It just means I should know how to find the information that I need to complete this pull request. Uh, you should also check to see if you have the appropriate time to um, work on the issue. Um, some issues might be good, like good for first contributors, but it might take you a while um, 
some I think that's the case with testing issues more so than it is um, documentation issues because you kind of have to keep rerunning the test suite and it gets a bit more involved because you have to sometimes have to do more reading of the code to figure out how to write the tests. Um, and then in addition to making sure that you have time to actually do the actual pull request um, or address the actual issue, you want to make sure that you have the time to do the follow-up for it. Um, this is something that I saw a lot when I was a contributor on a project and when I was also someone who was reviewing or merging pull requests is somebody um, like submits a pull request to a project and it's great, they fix an issue, um, but there's like one thing they have to fix before it can be merged and like you point it out to them and it takes forever uh, for them to get back um, or it just drops off. Like it's good for you to be somewhat responsive, like obviously you don't have to be checking you know, the pull request that you opened every like 30 minutes to see if somebody responded to you. Um, generally, I would say, I'm starting to go off on a tangent, but um, generally I would say if you've submitted a pull request to a project and one of the maintainers or collaborators have provided feedback to you, uh, a good rule of thumb, in my opinion, is to not leave the pull request unchanged for two weeks after um, you've received feedback from the project maintainer or collaborator. And that sort of is a common courtesy to everyone in the community. Um, if you decide um, that you can no longer work on it, you can close the pull request and that way somebody else knows that, hey, um, this issue still doesn't have a pull request um, submitted for it to address the issue. Um, or just like to let the maintainer know that you're not going to be tackling it anymore um, if you don't think you can follow up um, on the changes they want within like two weeks or so. So yeah, that's kind of um, like the checklist I would go through as you start to think about what issues you want to tackle. Um, it's just making sure you have time and the ability to um, actually like work on the issue. Like it's um, feasible for you to find the right resources to um, address the issue or you already know what you need to change to address the issue. Uh, so let's say you've like picked um, this issue that you want to tackle. Um, the first thing that you're going to want to do is go back to the contributing document again now that you have a better sense of like where you're going. Um, this map that is the contributing document is going to be more useful because you have a sense of your final destination which is com like submitting a pull request to address a particular bug. Um, and so you'll notice here that the first thing that they um, tell you to do under code contributions is to fork a copy of the, uh, is to make a fork of the repository and then check out your copy locally. Uh, this is something that you're going to see across a ton of um, open source projects is usually you're working on your own fork and you um, submit changes to your fork and then you submit pull requests to the main repository. And making a fork is pretty easy in GitHub. All you have to do is click the fork button at the top um, right. Um, and you'll notice here I actually have a fork of Node already. Um, since I've contributed to it before. So you'll see it's at the bottom here. Um, but for you, um, if this is like your first time uh, forking a repository, you should see your user org, which is just like your GitHub username on this list here. And if you click it, it'll fork it to like your local user org. But for now, I'm just gonna go to my already pre-existing forked copy. Um, and uh, one thing you'll notice um, with the fork is that you do have to keep your fork up to date with um, the what's known as the upstream or the main branch or the upstream or the main repository, which is Node.js node. So you'll notice I've been doing a bad job of doing that and I'm 195 commits beyond, behind um, the master branch on Node.js, so I need to, to get better at that. But once you've forked it, uh, you can make a local copy. Uh, and really quickly, I'm going to try and see if I can um, uh, switch to my 
terminal window um, so that you guys can see that. All right. Um, okay, is everyone able to see my terminal window right now? Yep, looks good. Awesome. I actually think I would I will just show the entire screen um, just to avoid switching around. Um, and so at that point, you want to um, make a local copy of whatever um, repository you've just forked onto your machine. Um, and so you'll find the URL that you need to use under the clone or download button here. Um, so if you copy that, um, and um, the command for this is um, just git clone and then the actual URL. Um, if you're not familiar with git, um, there's a ton of online resources that you can use. Um, if you do like git interactive tutorial, there's a tutorial that'll teach you the basics of git um, and stuff like that. Um, and I, I suppose I should kind of preface my discussion in case um, some people aren't experienced with Git yet. Um, you will need to have um, like understanding of whatever um, version control system the project uses. So if they're using like Git, you'd need to know Git or SVN or all of that fun stuff. Um, so I guess that's another thing you need to have um, before you contribute. So I'm actually not going to run this clone command since I've already got node cloned onto my machine from um, a while back. Uh, so I'm just going to cd to node. Awesome. Um, and really quickly, I'm going to run git branch to list all of the branches that I currently have um, on this repository. Um, right now, I'm on a specific branch for a, um, a contribution that I was making. So I'm going to go back and um, jump onto my master branch. Um, and then usually what you're going to want to do um, once you're onto master is um, make sure that it's in sync with upstream. Um, and then you're going to make sure that you have, um, that you check out a new branch for whatever um, kind of change that you're looking to make. Um, so you could do something like git checkout dash b, which is basically saying um, check out a branch um, with this name, and if the branch doesn't exist, make it. So let's say my first contribution. And in this particular branch, this is where you would like make all of your um, changes um, and all of that fun stuff. So maybe, I don't know, uh, you like change a readme or something. Um, you go through a typical Git workflow, which involves adding your changes, um, committing them, making sure that you adhere to the um, guidelines that that particular project has around committing. And then um, once you've kind of done all of the Git work and the file changes on the local, on like whatever environment you're comfortable with, then you'd go in and um, back onto the GitHub interface. If you go into your fork, what you should see here is like a blue bar that lists out the branch name for the new branch that you made. So in my case, it would be like my first contribution. And it'll allow you to make a pull request. Um, let's see if I can do one here. Um, yeah, so it'll allow you to make a pull request um, and usually you'll have to write out a description of the change you made. You can see a diff of the changes that you made here, um, as well as your commits. Um, and once all of that is done, you'd hit create pull request. Um, and like your pull request would go out into the world. And um, if the project has any CI set up on it, um, th that continuous integration would run any tests or things like that. Um, and then you'd eventually have to wait for the maintainers or collaborators of the project to um, get back to you with feedback. Um, 
so all of that was pretty quick, and that's because I actually think that the kind of process of forking, cloning, um, working with Git is um, pretty easy to get a hold of. There is a ton of documentation um, and resources out there that explain this process. Um, what I think is harder to do when you're trying to make a first contribution is actually like just get into the weeds of what you need to do. And I think that's the place where a lot of people check out when they're trying to submit their first PR um, is like, okay, I know what issue I need to address and maybe it's like simple um, when I look at it in isolation, but then like as you start to read through the code and get a better sense of what it is you need to do, you realize that this there's this like entire underlying complexity um, that makes it very difficult to um, get up to speed with the project um, and a lot of it is just developing like good code reading habits um, and being like a good investigator of open source and being in, improving like your code reading skills um, and once you have that down I think everyone's definitely set up to be a good open source contributor I'm going to leave the last couple of, or the next couple of minutes uh, for anyone to ask any questions um, if they're interested. I know I went through everything really quickly, so if you feel overwhelmed with anything I said, um, it's not your fault, it's mine. So just submit a follow-up question on um, the little questions tab um, on the side and I'd be happy to address them. Hey, I Sophia, also... I've got a question. Um, yeah. So I've I've played I've dabbled in Git a little bit, uh, and I've sort of defaulted to using the Git client. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something that you've used, or can you sort of compare using the client to how you've sort of been going uh, along with your your workflow so far? Uh, when you say client, do you mean like the GUI client, or yes, do you mean the exactly. command line? Yeah, um, I use the command line um, just because it fits in better with my workflow. Usually my typical workflow is having Vim as my editor on one side, um, and then I've got like um, a, some sort of terminal multiplexing set up so that I have multiple terminal windows in one screen. Um, and I just feel more comfortable with the command line. I have tutored and worked with people who have um, been more comfortable with um, the user interface or like the GUI and that's totally fine um, like the what happens when you use the GUI and what happens when you use the command line is the same thing uh, so whatever floats your boat is good to go okay or along those same lines are there any other tools that you use that you might recommend Ooh, um, so I had a a Twitter rant about this um, a while back. I talked a little bit about how I'm kind of a tooling minimalist. I tend to not use um, a lot of tools when I develop just because I'm not the kind of person who like, I don't know, I'm not like the, mo I'm probably not the most productive hacker. Like I don't have a ton of stuff going on in my Vim setup or any cool extensions or things like that. Um, I kind of use Vim um, one really crazy thing that freaks people out is I don't have syntax highlighting turned on. Um, so if I like open up a C++ file, there's just like no syntax highlighting and I think people think I'm like not a human being or something because I have that set up. Um, the tangent being is that I don't have a lot of um, things going on in the way of tools just get um, and Vim and um, sometimes I'll set up my command line or my shell so that um, it auto completes certain things for me like branch names um, which isn't provided by default um, but other than that yeah that's a pretty plain Jane when it comes to my tooling yeah that's actually pretty cool um, I don't meet a whole lot of minimalists out there so uh, it is you know it's good to see that side of the that side of the coin. Yeah.
Any other questions? Do we have anything on Twitter? No, it's been pretty quiet. Nice. I could totally tell a couple of jokes now or something. <laughs> Anybody have any questions on the line? Feel free to post it to chat. What's one of the projects that you've enjoyed most working on? Um, Node. Um, I guess just because the excitement of contributing to Node is still fresh on my mind. I um, worked with a couple of the maintainers at Node Interactive, which is a conference for Node, um, last week, and I got a couple of contributions in. And there's always, like, the awesome feeling of submitting a pull request and then getting it merged and, like, you freak out a little bit because you realize that, like, your code is about to be in running in, like, every server slash computer in the world soonish. There's, like, this weird power um, or this weird empowerment to it. Um, so Node has been really fun to contribute to. Um, it's a bit of a probably on the more difficult end to get started with, um, if I'm being honest with everyone, just because... Um, the code base does have a lot of components. There's JavaScript in there. There's C++ in there. Um, there's a lot of things going on in Node. Um, so it's definitely one of the more complex projects. And I kind of live in the JavaScript world, so that's where a lot of my experience is. I'm not sure um, what other languages or ecosystems everyone else is working in. Do you have any recommendations? Uh, I know it's probably tough because the uh, the, there's so many projects out there, but um, any maybe areas for somebody to that's just getting started to look uh, for for a project uh, for their first one? Uh, yes, uh, there's a great website. Let me see if I can remember um, the name for it. Yes, it's called Your First PR um, on Twitter. And what they basically do is um, tweet out good first contributions for people uh, to do. Um, and usually the maintainer of a project will tweet it out and um, they'll post it on their GitHub issue page. So you'll see here there's like a ton of issues that um, projects have opened up um, that they need addressed. Um, so let's say it looks like a torrent client needs a specific feature um, addressed or something. Um, so that's a great place to start if um, you're looking for your first pull request. And I think um, another place to look is OpenHatch. Um, and they also have a good solid list of um, good, pro good first projects to contribute to. Um, if you hit find a project, I guess I'll have to wait and let it load. Um, so those are two good resources. I also like to say, like, if you have the opportunity to go to, like, industry conferences um, or things like that, like, network with different people and see if you can find anyone who's an open source um, maintainer and kind of build a relationship with them and see if they would be open to having you help out on their project. And usually they will be, like, they'll get really excited that somebody wants to help them out and they'll, like, sit down with you and guide you through it. If you can't attend industry conferences for whatever reason, um, there's always Twitter if you're following any um, developers who maintain or write open source projects. Like, um, they'll usually tweet out when they need help with something. Um, that's also a good place to look. Just out of curiosity, another thing that I think um, can be intimidating for people just getting started is, you know, a lot of people maybe don't have a, a background, like maybe they didn't go to school for coding. Um, you know, maybe they have uh, an IT degree or an engineering degree, but, you know, they're, they just feel like, well, I didn't go to school for this. How, you know, is it, so, is it feasible for me to go out and learn this on my own? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, most of the open source maintainers and creators I know are actually college dropouts or people who just never went to college, and that might just be biased based on the circle I'm in. 
Um, but like I was showing before, even if you're like feel a little bit uncomfortable with your coding skills, there's a lot of issues that are related to documentation that you can tackle. And in the process of tackling those um, non-code related issues, you'll have to read the code base and kind of just, it's a good way to develop your um, coding skills without actually coding because um, you're reading what good code looks like or maybe not good code because that's kind of a subjective thing. Um, but you're reading what different types of code exist out there and it's kind of improving your skill. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't think coding can be should be a hindrance to participating in open source and I talk a lot about how the best open source projects are the ones who can engage people who see themselves more as designers or as technical writers um, or as DevOps or infrastructure people. Um, like open source is a really holistic effort um, and you don't have to just be like a code monkey to participate. Very cool. So it sounds like, you know, just about anybody can get started. It's really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, any other th uh, things you'd like to plug or um, tell people how they can get a hold of you uh, or where to find you um, online? Yeah. The best place to find me is my Twitter, which is, um, as Adam showed everybody earlier, um, is at Captain Sophia. That's where I'm usually like tweeting stuff on open source. And I will occasionally make um, like calls out to help with a particular issue um, in one of the open source projects I help out with. So that's a good place. And then I have my website, which is sophia.rocks. Um, and I've got like at the bottom, you'll see um, a little like mail button you can press if you want to email me um, one on one. And I'm also Captain Sophia on GitHub. So if you want to like see what I've contributed to or stuff like that, I'm on there. Um, I'm Captain Sophia on pretty much everything. So if you want to like dig up my old Neopets account or something, uh, you can do that too. Great. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll give uh, give people one last chance to yeah. chime in with questions uh, in the chat or on Twitter. Yeah. Don't be shy, everyone. I don't bite. <laughs> How long have you been uh, working with Node? Node um, as a contributor or as a developer? Uh, both. Uh, as a developer, um, three years. As a contributor, like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So what what is the difference between the, a developer and a contributor? Um, I would say a developer is somebody who uses um, the project or um, the product, and a contributor is somebody who helps build it. So up until recently, I wasn't, I was using Node, but I wasn't fixing bugs or making documentation fixes to the actual Node project. Um, and I think that's the distinction. Um, I guess a better term to use would be user versus contributor. Gotcha. Yep, that makes sense. Now, do you uh, a lot of uh, you know people out in the open source community? They they have their day job and then they kind of have projects that they do on the side, either for fun or maybe they've you know they've trying to have a business venture or something. Where do you fall on the spectrum? Do you do a lot of your coding just for your day job, or do you do also some? Yeah, I'm a I'm definitely a nights and weekends contributor. Um, by day, I do consulting work in the web development space. And by night, I just go crazy and contribute to a ton of open source. Yeah, that's really cool. I think that's one of the things that makes the open source community so great. Uh, you know, people like yourself. That, that's they, they do it not because they have to, because it's their job, but that's what they enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think unless you have anything else, uh, Safia, I think we'll we'll wrap up. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have anything else, just that um, I know there's a lot of kind of um, maybe hero worship of open source maintainers or contributors or um, feelings of incompetence um, around whether or not you might be able to contribute to open source. I'd say just like throw all of that out the window um, and really use contributing to open source as a way to kind of uh, exercise your mind and just challenge yourself in your spare time if you have any um, and kind of change up the pace um, for the way that you like approach software in your development career. Um, and don't worry about not being good enough or not having enough smarts or not having enough skills because uh, I don't think anyone is ever going to be enough for anything they want to do because um, everything should always be a challenge. So just dive into it and uh, you'll do great. Very good. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just run through um, the scheduling real quick uh, and the giveaway one more time. Uh, if I can make myself presenter real quick again. So the the schedule's up on the, the screen again, and you can see uh, Safia's uh, Twitter handle. Um, and then one more time, the, the all important giveaways. Uh, this is really important for V Brown Bag, uh, and you know definitely want to thank our sponsors uh, one more time. Uh, appreciate all they do for us and for the community and helping us out with the with the cool uh, giveaways. Uh, so I think that'll wrap it up for the December seventh edition of the V Brown Bag. Want to thank Safia uh, for spending the time and uh, really informative session. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me.